please, uh, if you want to, there's some water around as well, if anybody wants any, and then we'll, as I said, we'll include, include the mask later on. So if you please want to ask a question, we'll come round with an open mic, and you kind of try and keep them relatively short, because maybe a lot of people want to ask questions, and um, we can do that. Robert was just going to say beforehand, and then, then we'll come up and take for we just wanted to update us on the case, you know, just given the, the power of the film. So if you want to update it, drop it then. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming. Um, I, I'll try to be brief because um, there might be a lot of questions. So um, I just want to give you a, a brief update. Uh, we saw what happened. The state of Louisiana appealed uh, that conviction and uh, Federal Appeals Court uh, overturned Albert's conviction. Uh, since that time, uh, he has been moved uh, from Angola State Prison uh, to another correctional institute about 250 miles, still in the state of Louisiana, um, where he's very, very isolated in his status uh, in solitary confinement remains. He, in other words, he still remains in uh, solitary confinement, and he's um, again at a uh, home correctional facility. Can I think I lost. Apology, Robert. Well, always to tell you. I think I can go boom and I, I can boom a little bit. I don't know if you can hear me in the back. Yeah. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, yeah. Come with that. I'll try to boom and. Uh, in, anyway, uh, yes, so Albert is uh, at uh, Wade Correctional Institute, and he's still in solitary life conditions. Uh, his case has been uh, successfully, as you say, uh, depending on how you look at it, uh, overturned by uh, a three judge panel on the federal uh, uh, Fifth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeal. He remains again still in custody, and uh, hopefully, sometime in January, there is a hearing. Uh, the same judge, Judge Brayden, overturned <coughs> Albert's conviction and recommended that he be released on bail. Uh, he has the case again, and there is another issue of uh, reversible error uh, uh, that he can overturn Albert's conviction on. Herman's status is that he is now, uh, after having uh, passed through the state court and having his case uh, rejected uh, in a three judge panel at the highest level on the state, which was the Louisiana State Supreme Court, uh, we are now at the voice statements in the federal courts with him and uh, his case. And he's very optimistic. He believed that uh, his case will, will gravitate along um, that with Albert. Uh, you know they did not go to trial at the same time. They went up the a judicial ladder uh, differently. Uh, the issues that they have to present, they're the same. Their constitutional rights were violated from both amendment rights, you know, which protects you against unlawful intrusion in the state to six amendment rights being denied the right to effective assistance of counsel, which is, you know, allegedly allotted to everyone. And also uh, being denied a due process, which is a 14th Amendment violation. But having said all of that, I mean, we can talk about procedure, we can talk about what Buddy Caldwell talked about procedure. This case is not about any constitutional errors or procedures of the Constitution being violated. This case is all about retribution. It's all about manufacturing evidence against people who were obviously innocent of a crime. There was a rush to judgment. Uh, Buddy Caldwell would have you believe, if you listen to Buddy Caldwell, you would think that, you know, he was there on the scene. Matter of fact, Buddy Caldwell had nothing to do with this case initially. His partner, John Centerfield, 
or Zeke Pia, who was the prosecuting attorney at the time, he is the person who prosecuted Al. He was about 25 or 30 years senior of Buddy Caldwell. But what happened, John Sinkfield went on to make a career out of prosecutorial misconduct, prosecuting cases. And Albert's case is one of those cases. And Herman's case is one of those cases. He has made a career. His career has been validated by the fact that he has been able to keep Herman and Albert in prison. He was the attorney general. He moved up the ladder. He became a politician, and he was the attorney general of the state of Louisiana. He served his turn, and one of his assistants, whom you saw his buddy Caldwell, he now holds the reign. And he has now taken the case, and he seemed to be obsessed with the case. He has somehow uh, he's transformed this obsession far beyond probably what John Sinterfield would have done. But I imagine you can expect this from a man who uh, sometimes think he's a, and I don't have anything against Elvis. I like Elvis Presley. <laughs> you know, I, I really, I like some of his songs. I don't have anything against him. <laughs> Great singer, you know. But here's a man who sometimes think he's a, he's a, I mean, he's an Elvis impersonator. Um, this is the type of person we're dealing with. He also feels at times that he has been abducted by, quote, illegal aliens. This is on record. And this is a man that you have validating and, you know, using his irrationality to keep people who are in prison who have obviously been, all of the evidence against them has been undermined. We have the judges on our side in this case. It's not that we don't have the judge. You would think that the judges are the one who is keeping this going. We've had magistrates both on the state and the federal level to recommend that both be given a new trial. And we've had in one of the cases, in the case we have, a Judge Brady, uh, he, rec he recommended that case be, I mean, after his magistrate, Christine Nolan, recommended that Albert be given a new trial, he adopted that conclusion, overturned Albert's case and recommended that he be Released on bond, but again, Buddy Caldwell. And what you see is obsession with this case. But what we want to emphasize and what we hope to continue to emphasize and what we have been focusing on it is the fact that we can recount all of the procedure errors that we know. This case is based on innocence. I think we have to try to convince, we have to continue to focus, you know, on the ideology that just because something is legal, it doesn't mean that it's morally and it's wholly correct. You know, legality and morality in the courthouse does not shake hands. There is an adversarial testing ground uh, that a prosecuting, a prosecuting attorney should have and a, and a defense lawyer should have. They shouldn't be bad buddies. You know, going to lunch together and having drinks together and discussing the, the, the client and how he's how he going to sell his client out. It, but it, it is not a case like that. It is a case dealing with moral, the seeds of morality. When I say morality, I don't mean going out in space, being metaphysical and all that. I don't mean that. I am speaking of the decency that exists in human beings, the, 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 the ability you know, and the attribute to be fat. And I am telling you that the legal system in America and, the, and consequently the world, you know, operates on legal precepts. I don't have anything against legal precepts, but when legal precepts become the deity and the god of a society, something is wrong. It was legal to own slaves during Chattel in America, but it wasn't until the people saw it as being morally reprehensible that something was done about slavery. Prison is an extension of slavery. People say the 13th Amendment, when so-called Chattel ended, abolished slavery. Nothing could be further from the truth. The 13th 
13th Amendment does not say slavery was abolished. And just leave it at that. They may only say slavery, no involuntary servitude shall you know, exist on these shows that it inserted except one who has been duly convicted of a crime. How many people in the state have been duly convicted of a crime but were actually totally innocent? So if you are duly convicted of a crime and legally sentenced for a crime, you can be a slave. And if you are legally sentenced to death, they can kill you. They did it to Troy Davis, the latest one, he's not the latest one, the well-known one a few weeks ago. He was legally incarcerated. But morally, all of the evidence showed that he was actually innocent. So you could be legally guilty, you know, in a system of legal precepts. And again, I don't have anything against legal precepts if they are implemented with some moral fortitudes in it, some moral aspect of it. But if you just have a system based on legality, you can, they can kill you, a system can kill you legally, but you could be morally innocent. I will leave those questions. Thank you.
who just happened to be black in the White House. He's a politician. <coughs> His first and foremost duty is to him, the American people, the entire American people. So he focused on this. Of course, he is given the power at Christmas time <laughs> to pardon the turkey. But that same power does not give him, you know, that power to pardon a prisoner who has been convicted by the state and who has went through the courts. It does not give him that power to do it. Of course, there are some roundabout ways he probably or perhaps could intercede, you know. But for him to do so, it would be like a dictator to people, especially the Tea Party, who a lot of people believe, by the way, uh, are the folks that that's to be reckoned with. Don't believe that. The Tea Party did not elect Obama to the White House. The Republicans who are denouncing him and who are throwing all types of impediments in his way also did not elect him. The people that really are electing him are still behind him. I think what he needs to know is that he has a force behind him that is much stronger than all of the other opposition that you see on Fox News. I'm sorry. You know, if anybody here from Fox News, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't mean this is not going to put it. Don't take it personal. Not an attack against you if you wait for Fox. But there's an agenda that Fox has that is unrelated to what the people in the United States have and what democracy is all about. You know, so. You know, and again, getting back to the point that there are three separate entities, three separate, you know, units of layers of, of law. And so it's the executive branch is the highest level. You know, and then you, you, you know, you got the, uh, you, you have the, 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 the legislative branch, which consists of Congress people and representatives. You know, and then you have Republicans and Democrats, and you got those fighting in the election to see who can be the majority in whichever party. And then below them you have the judicial branch, which deals with criminality. And they are um, sort of, and I use that so to speak, they give them the, the, the sovereignty to prosecute, to kill, man, murder, incarcerate, impose slavery by whatever name, Euphemism you want to use, it, it's okay, it's still the same. But they have this authority and they have this power. And so, and while <clears throat> Thor, uh, that President Obama has the power to, to pardon the Turkey at Christmas, he, he don't have that same authority and power and sovereignty, you know, um, to pardon a human being who obviously have been, you know, falsely convicted for crime. But check this. I am a firm believer of cause and effect. When you throw pebbles in the pond, you, you, you get ripples. I believe there's a ripple, a rippling effect in the nation. And some of you probably haven't heard it, but I was in Spain a couple of days ago, and I heard it, and it's not on a lot, a lot of the televisions around here. But there is a movement, but even before that movement against corporate America and corporate capitalism, Sorry, I, I don't have anything to do with people capitalism. But corporate capitalism, I have a problem with that. And that is what's been running America for ages and stoles and blows and people are dying as a result of it. But there is a movement, take my word for it. There is a movement in the state against corporate <coughs> greed and corporate capitalism. Don't care what you hear the Tea Party say or the Republicans say or deny. You will see it. There is a movement. Also, and before that, and prior to that, there is a movement against abolishment of the death penalty as a result, a direct result of Troy Davis being executed. Whereas before, you know, not that people were like a daisy or anything like that, or stagnant, but they were not out front, and they did not progress it, you know, we progress it the way they are doing it now. So there is something going on. And I think the reverberations will 
be felt across the oceans. Sure. Mm. Can I just thank you Robert for coming to Liverpool especially in this month Black History Month for us um, we're celebrating this year and well, this month in particular Black History and I think it's really appropriate that you've turned up and and been invited by Joe and the university to our city in this month. And I can only thank you. Your story is very inspirational. I'm a chief exec of a local small black organization. But Joe, I want to know how we can show that film to our community, in our community, in our centers, in the youth clubs, our young people need to see and hear your story. You are a true inspirational and I am so proud of you.
But this type of solitary confinement went on for six months. It was the belief that if they placed a person in that type of environment, kept them away from society for six months, they would go crazy or they would become so remorseful that they would never, ever, ever commit another crime. The difference in Angola now, America took it and brought it to a different level. The courts eventually eliminated that form of solitary confinement. What America did was transported it and brought it to another level. They said, well, all right, this is what we want to do. We want to take you and put you in a cell for 23 hours a day. We're going to minimize what you can have. You're going to be in there for the rest of your life. And if you went to Angola, you was in prison for the rest of your life. So if you was way back then, you know, a victim of solitary confinement when it was first invented by the Quakers, you were going to be out in six months if you didn't go crazy. In Angola, Louisiana, and in America, you could do 60 years in solitary, or the form of solitary confinement that they have established and never get out. So I just want to point out that when solitary confinement in America is not the type of solitary confinement you see in old movies. That, that, that the solitary confinement in America is the type that keeps you away 23 hours a day, sometimes 24, limits you. Everywhere you go, you're shackled and you're handcuffed. Uh, and they try their best to dispel and prevent you from communicating. But, and sometimes you get punished for being up for communicating. But uh, guys communicated right on. So I just wanted to make that point, of course we were. And then there were times when we were not allowed. At one time we were allowed 12 books. One time we were allowed six books. At some time, we, at one time we weren't allowed to contact business at all. At one time we weren't allowed to go in the office. I was in prison for nine years before I ever got a chance to go in the office. Uh, but this, uh, this is a type of, you know, this is what goes on in prison. There are different categories of different forms. And, they are different, depending on where you are, they are different um, status of what they call South Carolina. What I'm trying to think was, if you were Black Panthers, if you were this size, as you were, do you think you would have been treated as you were? You know what I mean? If the politics wasn't was involved as much? <coughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure it was political, it was a political reason. Because I was not even in, I was not in prison when the security guard, you know, was, was slain. I was 150 miles away. Uh, nevertheless, they investigated me for 29 years. Uh, I didn't get back to that prison, had never met the man in my life, but I was investigated for this crime, not because I was there, not because I was a co-conspirator, but because I was a member of the Black Panther Party, so it wasn't politics. Yeah, it was politics. What did you read that most inspired in prison? <coughs> I heard the last part. What did the most inspire? Most inspired? I didn't hear. What did you read? Oh, well, I didn't discriminate. Sometimes you couldn't really get uh, any writing, but I was introduced to the type of writing that I never ever saw in the school that I went to. You know, I met Mao, Che, George, I even you and Newton, I joined the Black Panther Party. I mean all those ministers, the writers of the 20th century, you know, uh, Richard Wright, you know, uh, these people who, who, who had written books way back, Frederick Douglass, I didn't know anything about Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth. All of the, the writing that I was able to get at the time, and I guess at some point, yeah, we were allowed to have these in, in the prison. Uh, there was writing floating around prison like this. You, they eventually moved them and put it in the library, but before going to the library, I read. So which is the most inspirational book that I read? I think if I would ask, I would say George Jackson prison letters inspired me, but I, I, look, I can't because I, I see all these books. The, the books that I read, I, I, I read most, I read, the, the, I read all these. I read French, French for now. I mean, I just name them. You go down and list, and I read a prostitute. I just name them. I read all the brothers from, oh, I've been Jewish in Nigeria, and I, on and on and on. I could go, go on the infinity, name the, the books.
look at our record. It is hard to see which one was more inspirational. I think all of them <coughs> contributed to my evolution. And I, I enjoyed when I read them, I enjoyed all of them. I got a little bit from all of the books. Do you think that um, keeping them for Still in prison, there's more a political view of the American government, so, the, so it's not shown the inhumane way that tr prisoners are treated constantly in America. So it's, they're not embarrassed. I'm trying to. Just saying that, is it st keeping the uh, prisoners, um, your, your friends in America, keeping them in, in prison, is more to save the embarrassment of the American government? Over the, you know, so they don't, the inhum, inhumanity of it all is not shown. Uh, yes, well, you know, the American government had weathered the embarrassment before and it continued. Um, of course, keeping uh, people like that in prison or innocent people in prison, uh, it, it should be an embarrassment to the American government, but uh, the American government just doesn't uh, care. That segment of it doesn't care. Uh, I think people in, in society we need to refocus on on prison. I think um, until and unless the majority of people, and not in America, but I mean, like I said, don't get me wrong, I, my, just, I've been to England maybe more than half a dozen times, been here at least three, four times. But I've also been all across America, you know. I've been to just about every university in America. You know, I've been just about every state in America. It's not just, and I, my message is the same, you know. I, I do believe people, uh, you know, uh, could, are not just in America, because our problem, it, go, it goes beyond uh, America. It, 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 you know, because America, what, uh, America, uh, it has an uh, influence on a lot of policies of, around the world. And so this is why I believe, you know, people around the world also have to be concerned about what goes on in America, because sometimes where America goes, everyone goes, and if America goes in more, everybody else would go in more, all those like the blind and the blind. But I do believe this, that there are people who can prevent this, people who, who are, who, who are dissent, people who make their voices, and they, their dissent known. And it, it has to be, not until it impact you directly, you know, it has to be done before, because once a pebble, it waits negative, there's a negative and a positive acceleration, and it waits both ways. Once a pebble is in a pond, the ripple goes. You know, it goes for progressive, it can go for negativity. So, I wouldn't wait. I would be concerned. If you don't do it, okay, you know. But some people just say, well, I'll I just leave it like that. Some people, people, why is he complaining? Some people say, America is heaven. I don't get this same perspective of People have a right to their prerogative, but I was born and raised in America. And I can tell you the same thing, that America is, if they, if some people believe America is heaven. And I said, well, yeah, America is heaven to some. But I let people know that in heaven, they got some people catching hell. Accept 
you know, and to embrace a way that is so unholy until it does it just to, to them. So, you know, looking at it like that, I, you know, I have a, a much broader perspective. So, when you say, do I believe African uh, American will ever achieve justice? I think justice is an ongoing thing, and I think it emerges as time evolves and it goes on. And I think justice is it, it evolving. I don't think it's stagnant. I think there are people, and black people, African Americans in, in, in America, because America has a history of discrimination against people based on skin color, and because a construct was constructed based on skin color, I think they're at the very end, and that they uh, achieve the, 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 the ability to achieve justice escapes elude them much greater than it do other people who are also victims of injustice. Because I believe we are all victims of politics. When I see politics, I think it's in the, especially in America, the politics in America tells you that America is a democracy. Democracy for who? It's democracy for people who are rich, corporate, Democracy. There is no, there is no democracy. Even the middle class has been eroded. Uh, it, that may have tasted a little democracy, but that is not it. People, democ democracy means people's power. Come from the word, the Greek word, people power. But people don't have power. So with people not having power, they don't have justice neither. They have relinquished their voting rights to politicians. So black people, African American, may, may be at the very end of this rudder, this ladder. There are other people. Also, will they achieve justice? So I say it's evolved. I think knowledge, you know, racism, discrimination, or learning reflex. Anything I'm a cause, I'm a former again, a believer in cause and effect, and anything that is learned can be unlearned. And unless and until these things are unlearned, education, in my opinion, become a key. But you know, my karma tells me this. Your karma tells you I operate on another frequency. Cool. But my evolution and my knowledge tells me to operate on the frequency in which I do. And, you know, the, the, the you know, equations in which I make, this is the way I see it. Sorry. Okay, we've got another couple of questions here. I think then we'll maybe start to move towards the conclusions. Thanks for the short one. That's to do with uh, media outlets, news media outlets. Um, the media uh, holds such a such strong influence in society these days. I was just wondering whether you can give us a list, if any, of any of the media outlets, particularly the US media, which has given support to the Angola campaign. You know, media outlets like Sky, CNN, Fox News. <laughs> and, uh, and the rest of them. Because they are the ones these days who are, uh, you know, they're, they're quick to uh, condemn China, human rights abuses, and run these other countries. So it would be interesting to know to what extent, if at all, uh, United US media outlets have lent any sort of support to the Angola campaign? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, thank you. But we've had a whole segment. Um, NPR has given it, it, an extensive review on Angola 3. NBC has also covered. I mean, all of the smaller media around the, around the country has covered. Uh, but in spite of that, we we, we, we are going to continue to try to get more media coverage because after a point in time, things can become a certain point. But if we also go on our website, you can see this, that we have networks. I mean, we have links. If you go to www.angolatree.org, you will see all of the links that we have. Are you listening? I'm trying to answer the question. <laughs> Did you hear me? If you went to the website, if you went to the website, for all of the coverage that that you know that 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 we've had over the years, 
you will see. And it's like I say, it's just not just in, in you know, uh, you know, just just local stuff, but we've had national coverage as well. And of course, we've had BBC, BBC and other other areas like that. But having having media coverage, I think the biggest media are propaganda or grassroots. Uh, I don't. I think you know. Uh, I'm, I'm a firm, firm believer that grassroots people, I mean, we can have media, because media can kind of suppress things. Whichever media you get to, you know, to get behind you. But the idea, I think the biggest media is people. It may have been possible for a few, but again, I think it was a negative trend. 